Cloudflare's compute ecosystem has been evolving fast. With workers, durable objects, queues, and workflows, they built a powerful platform for creating back-end, edge-based services. But with that said, building on the worker platform does come with a few trade-offs due to the fact that all your server-side code runs on V8 isolates. The V8 isolate runtime is incredibly fast. Cold starts are virtually non-existent, but the downside is that you don't get access to the full Node.js API, no file system, no OS level access, and if your project relies on anything beyond JavaScript or TypeScript, getting it to run on the platform can be challenging. Now, to be fair, most modern web applications can absolutely be built on Cloudflare workers with no issues. But there is always a chance that 98% of your project works perfectly on workers, but then you come across a small feature that requires an actual server. When this happens, things can get tricky. You're stuck in a position where you have to move just that one feature to a totally different provider and manage a brand new service. This is tedious and needlessly complex. For many developers, just knowing there's a chance of this happening is enough to scare them away from ever getting started with Cloudflare. So, getting to the point of this video, Cloudflare just released the missing piece of their compute ecosystem, and this missing piece is called containers. To understand containers and how they're useful, let's take a look at a real-world application. Let's say you're building a service that allows users to fine-tune image models on specific objects or people. You build a UI where users can take photos of an object, you store these images in R2, and when the user is ready, you allow them to submit the images to be trained on a powerful GPU. To orchestrate the training process, you create a Cloudflare workflow with a series of steps. This workflow prepares the images for training, starts the training process, waits for the training to finish, collects the training files, and then notifies the user when the training is complete. You decide you want to use a service called a Replicate for model training. As you dig into the model training process on Replicate, you realize that your system might have two issues. Your first issue is that Replicate wants a zip file that contains your training images. You have each individual image stored in R2, so you essentially need to pull each file, save them in a folder on a server, zip the contents of the folder, and then upload the zip file back to R2. This type of workflow is not feasible on workers, as you don't have a file system, and you don't have access to lower level APIs that make this task easy. This is a situation where containers can be very useful. To solve this problem, you build a simple Go service that can receive an API request with the info related to the training. This info is passed to a handler that fetches the image IDs for a training, downloads each individual image based on an ID, and saves them in a folder, zips the folder of the training images, and uploads a zip file back to R2. You can now call the service directly in your worker code, where you are able to reliably prepare your training images and send them off to Replicate. The second issue that arises is the format of the training output. When training this type of model on Replicate, you're ultimately trying to collect a safe tensors file, which will be used at inference time in conjunction with a specific type of image model. Replicate packages the safe tensors within a tar file. In order to extract the safe tensors file, you need to first unpackage the tar file. This operation is also not feasible on the worker's runtime. So you create a collect safe tensors endpoint with a handler that downloads the tar file, extracts the safe tensors file from the tar file, then uploads the file back to R2. Now you are able to complete your model training pipeline by calling the collect safe tensors handler within your workflow. Now at this point you might be wondering why I wrote this component in Go as the rest of my worker code is written in TypeScript. The answer to this question is simple, because I like Go. And I also want to showcase the beauty of containers. I technically could have written this logic in TypeScript or Python or Java or really any other language. As long as my code exposes an HTTP endpoint and is packaged with Docker, I can now access it directly in a worker the same way I access any other Cloudflare resource. Now in a minute, we'll dive a bit deeper into the container API. But before that, I just want to address a few comments that I'll undoubtedly get along the lines of, but why not just use a VPS? Or, this just seems like an overcomplicated way of deploying to a VPS. To anybody that has these questions, I just want to say, I hear you. There's something freeing about packaging your entire service with Docker Compose, managing deployments with Coolify, and knowing that you'll never pay more than $6 a month for a side project. And to be frank, this is the exact way I prefer to ship side projects for the last five years. With that said, I do think most side projects running on VPSs are not considering things like, do I currently have a way to scalably and reliably handle long-running tasks? Have I evaluated how long requests take from users in India when my single server VPS is sitting in Oregon? If I have an MCP server built with Express running on a single core VPS, does my state management logic hold up when I scale up to two or more cores? Or if I'm using WebSockets, does my current implementation work when I scale out my service to multiple nodes that sit behind a load balancer? I bring these questions up not because they're impossible to solve if you deploy to a VPS, but because they require a concerted and intentional effort to solve if you are using a VPS. If you work for a big company, you'll likely use managed services within your cloud provider to solve these exact problems. And to me, these are the problems that Cloudflare's compute platform is addressing as it simplifies every layer of the stack. You don't have to spend too much time worrying about the caching and networking layer. And in the layer above this, you can build out your business logic, leveraging compute primitives that solve specific problems, like queues, when you want an easy way to build on top of the concept of at least once delivery. 
or workflows when you have logic that needs to be executed sequentially in isolated steps, or durable objects when managing complex server-side state, and obviously workers when handling requests and events. It's at this layer where you build your APIs, query your database, store and retrieve images, videos, and other documents, interact with API providers, and really any other IO-related operation, as all this logic makes sense to run on incredibly fast VA isolates. And finally now, for problems that don't make sense at this layer, we have containers that fit perfectly together within the workers platform, where we can solve tedious problems like zipping files. But you can also build services that utilize tools like FFmpeg or Python-based applications if you want to leverage popular data analytics libraries or even AI-generated code execution and validation. So while I understand the, why not just use a VPS take? The point I'm trying to make is that the workers platform isn't a one-to-one -one replacement of a VPS. It's more akin to a series of scalable compute products that allow me to solve specific problems really, really fast. And now, thanks to containers, I don't have to make as many compromises when engineering backend solutions. All right, so the time I'm making this video, containers are in private beta, so I expect a few things to change over the next coming weeks. However, I do think it's worth going over a few key container concepts. As I go into more detail, please do leave any questions that you have in the comments, as I'd like to make a follow-up video about this product as it matures over the next few months. Let's start by looking at the development process for building services that run on containers. When you containerize your code, it's usually a good idea to isolate the service in its own directory. It's entirely up to you to determine where this directory lives, but since containers are accessed via workers, it makes sense for me for this directory to sit at the root level of a worker project. In terms of designing a container service, it's important to consider how the app runs. Most container services will expose an HTTP handler as it's likely that a single container instance will handle multiple events or requests at the same time. Following this pattern, your service will run as a basic REST API where the entry points for events are HTTP handlers or routes. Once your container receives the request, it's up to you to implement the server-side logic for your use case. Once you build out your container service, you'll have to package it with Docker. If you're not familiar with Docker, the TLDR is, it's a tool that lets you package your app with all its dependencies so you can port it over to run on essentially any server. You'll do this by setting up a Docker file that specifies a base image, sets up all the needed dependencies, and executes a command that will boot up your application. If you're not familiar with Go, a node base image would look something like this. You have a node base image, some logic to handle dependencies, and a command to run the application. Regardless of your preferred language, you'll want to expose a port. This allows your Cloudflare worker to communicate with your container via HTTP requests. Now let's set up your worker to actually be able to communicate with your container. The lifecycle of a container is entirely managed by a durable object. If you're already familiar with durable objects, you'll notice that the durable object state now has a container property. And this container property contains methods for lifecycle management. Due to the fact that a container instance is tied to an instance of a durable object, you could in theory build a very sophisticated broker system where durable objects manage the routing and lifecycle of a cluster of distributed containers. But the vast majority of developers will simply use containers to offload some workload from a worker to a container. And for this use case, the developers at Cloudflare have created a new class called Container that extends the durable object class. The Container class is designed to remove most of the boilerplate required to set up container management within a durable object. It provides some simple configuration properties that dictate the behavior of a running container, like the port that's exposed in your Docker file, sleep after, which sends a signal to kill the container after not receiving requests for a certain period of time. This will dramatically lower your container bill as you don't have to pay for periods of inactivity. Enable internet if your container needs to make external requests and EMV vars, so you can pass variables and secrets to your container so it can access them during runtime. You also have hooks to capture lifecycle events from your container, but I don't want to go too deep into this interface as I'm sure things will change as Cloudflare gathers feedback during this beta launch. The main takeaway here is you can extend the container class to manage the behavior of a container instance. Once you have your container class defined, you'll want to head over to the Wrangler config and add a containers array. The containers configuration takes a class name, which is the name of your defined containers class, a path to your Docker file, the max number of active container instances you want running at a given time, and a unique name for your container. Once this is done, you'll also want to add the container class as an attached durable object to your worker. From here, you can run CF type gen, and now you're able to access your container from the bindings of your worker. Since containers are managed by a durable object, you can interact with them in the same way, where you get an instance by a given ID, then you call the fetch handler to make requests to your container. From there, the request is sent to the instance of the container and processed. At this point, you can deploy your code, and as long as you have Docker running on your computer, your image will be built and uploaded to the Cloudflare's registry, and your worker code will also be bundled and deployed. To drive home the process of building on top of containers, let's look at a basic example repo that I've thrown together. You can clone the repo in the description and follow along if you'd like. This repo consists of a simple worker entry point where the fetch handler passes the request to a Hono API. The Hono API implements a few endpoints which call two separate container services. There's a Python service that runs FastAPI and implements a few dummy routes. 
Now obviously a real world example would have actual logic behind these endpoints. But right now we're just trying to understand how to get containers running and how to deploy them. The second service is a basic Go HTTP handler that logs a bunch of stuff. Don't pay too much attention to this code as it's mostly AI generated slob. Both of these services have their own Docker file where the project gets set up. Dependencies are installed, ports are exposed, and an execution script is defined. If you head over to the Wrangler config, you can see that both containers point to their corresponding Docker file. Now heading back to our worker code, you can see that there is a container services file that contains the durable object setup for both container services. The index.ts file exports both these classes, and these classes are referenced in the containers and durable objects config within the Wrangler file. Now you just need to run CF type gen and your container bindings will be accessible. Local development is still a work in progress with containers, so I have been testing containers by running them locally. It's pretty simple to build and run a Docker container. If you're not familiar with this process, there's tons of resources online. At this point, we can deploy the application. You'll see that your worker code gets uploaded to Cloudflare, and then your images get built and are pushed to Cloudflare's container registry. Head over to the Cloudflare dashboard, and you'll see that your worker has two bindings. Collect your worker's URL. You can go to a browser, add your worker's URL, plus Python container and the request is forwarded to your container. Notice that the worker path and the container path are the same. So we are able to pass the raw worker request into the durable objects fetch handler. For the load balancer endpoint, the paths differ. So we need to pass the host name followed by the correct path of the container's route. Since the fetch handler belongs to the durable object, the request will always be routed to the durable object and then passed to the container. So it doesn't matter what host we defined, as long as the path that we defined matches what is in our container service. Also note that I'm using some helper functions called git container and load balance. Git container can be used if your container service is only meant to have a single instance running or if your worker implementation keeps track of the exact container instance names. You can use load balance to spread the compute across more than one instance, assuming that your container is configured to run more than one instance. The load balance code that we have implemented returns info about the Cloudflare region where it is running. If we refresh this endpoint a few times, we'll notice that the request might get routed to different regions. I'm personally not paying too much attention to the helper load balance function, as it is just a temporary solution to route requests. In a future release, the containers team should be rolling out auto-scaling, which may change the API a bit, but will also take care of most of the routing and scaling logic for us. Now at this point, I hope you have a basic understanding of how to build on top of containers. Before finishing this video, I just want to share a final example with an actual container implementation. Let's say that we have a workflow that uses FFmpeg for a video transformation. We can simply add FFmpeg as a dependency to our Python container, create two routes, upload and process video, and then go ahead and deploy. And now we have basic logic where we are able to upload a video and then get the same video back at two times speed using FFmpeg. If you're already building on top of the worker platform, you'll know how big of a win this is because this type of workload is not feasible on VA isolates. I love the fact that I don't have to offload this type of workload to another provider, and I'm excited to build more cool things on top of Cloudflare. I really hope that this video has sparked some ideas on how you can use containers to build more sophisticated services. And if you have any ideas, please do let me know in the comments. As the Cloudflare containers project matures and becomes generally available, I'm definitely going to move some of my production workloads over to it. Based on my learnings, I'd love to make a follow-up video that goes into more depth. So if you have any thoughts on specific services you want to see built on top of containers, please let me know.